This conference will now be recorded. Hi, hi everyone. Um, hi, Dr. Rania, and everyone is welcome to the meeting. Um, this gynecology mock, as you um, all know, this paper of the EMQ I posted uh, in the course group um, as a homework. However, even after I post the answer, still you have queries, my friends. So um, that's why I decided that we have this discussion today, so we can uh, clear some of the concepts together. Okay, so uh, let's start the question number one in our discussion. And if you have any query, please let me know about it. Okay, so in our EMQ number one, we see that there is a 60 year old woman attend the gynecology clinic with symptoms of urinary incontinence. So the information that we gather here is that the lady is old in age and she had symptoms of urinary incontinence. Routine urine dipstick is positive for leukocytes and nitrates and she had no symptoms of urinary tract infection so she is having urinary incontinence but not UTI. What is the most appropriate investigation for management from the list of options below? This um, comes from the NICE guideline of uh, at the introduction okay and how to deal with the lower urinary tract uh, symptoms so if we have the rule says if you have symptoms what you need to do in the presence of symptoms you have to offer treatment right plus investigation right until you have the culture result comes out is that correct Okay, so if no symptoms, but I have in the dipstick positive for nitrates, shall I offer treatment? Yes or no? No, yes, you are what? correct guys. So it's no need for the treatment at the moment because the woman doesn't have symptoms. So. Shall I just discharge her or shall I investigate? Of course, I need to investigate in this case. And the best investigation after dipstick is positive for leukocytes is? Yes, so this is the MCU, okay, for culture and sensitivity. So, dear friends, what is the most appropriate investigation as you can see now? the one that await the MCU result, right? Yes, correct. Yes, well done everyone. Okay, so let's see, next question. 20 years old woman present with lower abdominal pain. An ultrasound scan shows a large ovarian mass with cystic spaces. So what information I got here I got here in this EMQ that she's only 20 years, okay? So I'm thinking of maybe complex ovarian masses, maybe germ cell tumors, let's see. Present with lower abdominal pain. An ultrasound scan show large ovarian mass with cystic spaces and areas of hemorrhage and necrosis. The serum alpha fetoprotein is grossly elevated, right? What is the most likely pathological diagnosis? Do you remember in the tumor markers, which is very, very important in your exam? Okay, when we say about alpha fetoprotein raised dramatically in which tumor? In the alpha fetoprotein, maybe related to pregnancy. So remember yolk sac tumor. Yes, excellent. So it's the yolk sac tumor. So if I said that I have alpha fetoprotein yolk sac tumor, so how about LDH? LDH comes with the dysgerminoma. Okay, so you remember the D was D, dysgerminoma and 
LDH. How about the HCG? Yes, so that will be the choriocarcinoma. Yes, excellent, everyone. Okay, so when we come to the point of... When we come to the point of the uh, tumor markers, okay, my friends, so we will find that there is a big table at the beginning of the TUG article, okay? And... It's very important that we go through this TUG article for your final revision of the exam. Okay. One second, my dear friends. Uh, just give me one second. Uh, I want to show you this table, okay, for your own revision. Okay, thank you for waiting, guys. I'm sorry. It takes longer with me, okay. My dear friends, when we just say that there is some important point are there, especially from the two articles, what you need to do is please, please focus on the important point, especially for the recent talks or the one that came repeatedly in the exam, okay? And don't just wait till you find it in a question, okay? So please take care, okay? That's for uh, my dear friends who attended before, and we have discussed this before. However, no problem from repeating again and again. This famous table, guys, from the TUG article. Okay, so let me make it more larger for you. Okay, so how to go through this? If you have the source, the only way that you study it, right? Okay, so for the germ cell tumor, as you can see here, the last, this germinoma, so mainly we will see increase in the LDH. For the embryonal carcinoma, okay, we can see HCG and the question uh, of what is the embryonal carcinoma, this uh, a tumor cells, okay, that looks like embryo cells here. It can be malignant, it can be benign. So alpha fetoprotein, maybe yes, maybe no. LDH, maybe yes, maybe no, but mainly we will find HCG. Immature teratoma, immature teratoma, you might find alpha fetoprotein elevated plus the LDH, okay? You might also see in the immature teratoma increase of the DHEA, okay? So be careful if you give you two tumor markers in the exam because recently in the MQ, they give two tumor markers, okay? So be careful of this table. It, you should revise it, okay? So many times, so you will know which tumor marker can increase here, which tumor marker can also increase in this case, plus or minus. In a yolk sac tumor, we can see two things are there. It's alpha fetoprotein and LDH, okay? But if I give you only alpha fetoprotein, then this is what?
This is the yolk sac tumor, or sometimes comes in the exam as the endodermal sinus tumor. Okay. So I have alpha fetoprotein only in exam. This is yolk sac tumor. I have alpha fetoprotein plus LDH. This is still yolk sac tumor or endodermal sinus tumor. Okay. Okay. In the this germinoma, only LDH is there, so it's very specific to it. Makes your life easy. How about the sicoma? What can I see in the sicoma? In the coma, I might see one tumor marker that's inhibiting, increase or not. Okay. If we speak about the granulosa cell tumor, so in granulosa cell tumor, what do you remember about the granulosa cell tumor? Inhibin increase in the granulosa cell tumor, plus what else? The juvenile type is estrogen secreting, okay? However, I need you to remember that granulosa cell tumor can have increasement of the anti-malarian hormone, the MAMH. So be careful, okay? You might find in some type okay of the granulosa cell androgen secreting right but most likely it's juvenile type we find estrogen okay so please be careful amh increase in which tumor anti-malarian hormone increase in which tumor This is from the list. The only tumor that have AMH increase is the granulosa cell. Okay, so be careful, please. Okay, six core tumor. What can you see here in the six core tumor? There is no tumor marker seen with the six core tumor, guys. Okay. The sertoli leading, what can you see here? I can see that alpha fetoprotein can increase in hebein, yes or no? Testosterone, yes or no? Right? What else? A4 can increase, they here can increase, yes or no? Okay, so my dear friends, when he give you combination of hormone, okay, please, or the tumor markers, I'm sorry, please take care when the combination can work, okay? So as you can see, alpha fetoprotein alone, when it comes, remember the ectac tumor, if it comes with Increase alpha fetoprotein and LDH, then you sac tumor as well. How about if it is immature teratoma? Immature teratoma can have the possibility of both. Okay, please, in this case, look to the features of the ultrasound. Immature teratoma in the features of ultrasound is very specific, right? So, in the exam, he will give you two tumor markers plus ultrasound picture like what he did in January 2021 so he will make your life easy by the ultrasound features okay can you guys can you diagnose immature teratoma by ultrasound can you remember any features Hello, any any feature can you remember about the immature teratoma? Okay, so the calcification, good. Anything else?
immature teratoma tend to be large sized, okay? And it will have mixed echogenic masses. There will be cystic degeneration, okay? And there will be coarse calcification, okay? So the calcification, is very important, okay, with the mixed features and big size. Yes, excellent, guys. Okay, so let's see our questions. Phenotype says female. Karyotype says 46XX. FSH is undetectable. Estrogen undetectable. Uterus is present. Regarding the clinical information above, which is the most likely diagnosis from the list? Uterus present. Can I say AIS with the uterus present? What do you think, guys? Can I say so? Okay, so interner. How about the FSH in Turner, my dear? It's high, yes. Okay, so. Okay, guys, so please hold on, okay? It's not about that I can say any diagnosis, okay? So please take care, everything have a meaning here, okay? So, if she look like a female, okay? And karyotyping is XX. So, at the beginning, this is cannot be AIS. This is cannot be Sawyer syndrome, right? Is that correct? We have a female here, right? Okay, so, with undetectable estrogen okay and undetectable fsh what do we have here from the causes of amenorrhea if you remember is that hypo hypo or hyper hyper or normal normal what do you think okay so do you remember one of the causes of hypo hypo Kalaman is one of these causes, right? Okay, so when I say impaired for timing, okay, with all due respect to our friend, okay, who said impaired for timing, I must have the keywords or the buzzwords of the, or leading words to the impaired for timing. Like for example, okay, that, the young lady, she had cyclic pain. Okay, there is hematocolbus, right? So I must have something to tell me that this is impaired for timing, but FSH undetectable, guys. So please, okay, focus with everything. Yes, we have this table, okay, which is made by um, our mentor, Dr. Ahmed. But this table is not only the thing that you can remember in the exam, it's just helping you or guiding you for the differential diagnosis. Your ability to analyze the information given to you makes you a good doctor and makes you a good candidate for exam, right? So please 
focus with everything that's given to you. Before you take an answer, ask yourself, does this make any sense of the answer? Does this, you know, follow the case or not? Okay, so please take care. So let's have a look here. Okay, for for example, I have external features of female karyotyping female xx pubic hair is there breast development is okay uterus is present ovaries are present okay and the young lady she had cyclic cramp pain plus as we know the hematocolbus this is mix in bed for a time and she she had nothing okay okay MRKH is female, okay? And karyotyping is female, but due to a problem in the, what is the problem in the MRKH? It's a problem in the development, yeah, the, embryo, the embryology, which problem that has the agenesis Can you remember, my friend? Something that's responsible for formation of the ovary and upper vagina. Malarian, yes, excellent. Okay, so the malarian agenesis, it's developmental, it's anatomical problem comes from the embryo, embryo, embryology problem that is the malarian agenesis. Okay, it has nothing to do by you know, my hormone, she had hormone, she had ovary, okay, and she had good development. She had no uterus, okay, this is the MRKH, right? If you do a vaginal examination, would you find that it's short vaginal length or normal vaginal length? That would be short, right? Okay, so if I have Features, okay, of type one WHO ovulatory dysfunction. Like, for example, he gave me some leading words in the scenario, like very low BMI or severe exercise. Okay, so this is that's because the hypothalamic, you know, but sometimes also it can be due to Kalaman syndrome. Okay, anosmia make it very easy for you, but if it's not, then you have to think one of these. Okay, that can be one of the features, and you have to choose by exclusion. Also, pan hypo makes also the same picture. You will find pubic hair is less developed, breast less developed, however, ovaries is there, uterus is there. AIS, AIS looks like female but karyotyping is male so mainly i'm thinking of for the male karyotyping that this is could be a partial ais however this is not the case okay but complete ais complete ais is the one that looks like a super female because of unopposed estrogen right but she had xy you will find that there is scanty or no pubic hair because the problem in the AIS that the testosterone is not working, right? So we will not see the androgenic features. So that's why pubic hair is absent or scanty. Breast is well-developed. Why breast is well-developed? That's because unopposed estrogen, right? Uterus absent. She is basically a male. Ovaries is not there, but there is testis. The testis can present by, can present in this case by what? Inguinal hernia, right? So any 
gonad our present need gonadectomy why because it can turn into cancer right okay how about sawyer syndrome sawyer syndrome is one that is looks like female but karyotyping is xy but uterus is present so that's why we call it a male with uterus okay so in the case 20 years old karyotyping looks like female karyotyping xy uterus is present this is sawyer syndrome right turner turner is one of the most common that come turner is 45 xo okay so how can i say turner when it is xx right pubic hair is spare breast is less developed of course it's not a mosaic turner this is for a complete turner okay uterus is present but hypoplastic okay ovaries are strict strict gonads right what else can I see? She's short, she had webbed neck, she had doses, coarctation of aorta, white space nipple, right? She might have also renal anomalies. So this is regarding Turner. Turner is recognized by a primary or a secondary failure, right? Ovarian failure. So FSH usually will be high internal okay okay so other cases like lh receptor resistance lh receptor resistance it can be she will be a female but with karyotyping can be xy or xx bubic hair is not developed breast is not developed if it is xy uterus will be absent and there will be testis okay but is it one of the most common differential diagnoses that we have? No, it's not. Okay, so please, at least, there is no excuse. The common cases that can come in the exam, like imperfect hymen, MRKH, type 1 ovulatory dysfunction, AIS, Sawyer syndrome, Turner syndrome, no confusion, okay? You should know what is the characteristic of each one of them. See question number four. I hope that this is help. So, which test found to be useful for screening fertility patient for the presence of endometriosis? Okay. So, in the same, in the same, we will have another question in the same uh, paper. We have another question. What is the goal, the standards of diagnosis of endometriosis? Goal, the standard is laparoscopy. Okay, so when I start, when I start investigation for case of endometriosis i start with cvs but this is for the initial okay if i doubt if i have suspected case of endometriosis i would go for the cvs right if it's negative still i can do further referral okay i can make a trial by hormone for diagnosis okay but the gold standard because i can see by my eyes the endometriotic legion is the laparoscope right the lap can be diagnostic or can be for treatment in the same time right right okay so if i have a case with fertility problem i 
and I have suspected that the problem is endometriosis. So what test would give me the most important information that I need? Here, he's not asking gold standard. Here, he's not asking initial. You know that when I want to test the tubal function, usually we start by the histosalpingiogram for all the patients okay, who have fertility problems. But if the patient is high risk, like a patient who has previous history of BID, for example, okay, or a case with suspected endometriosis, so it's better to go for the diagnostic laparoscopy. Yes, excellent. So it will be diagnostic, lab and dye test, right? Test the tube, and if there is a chance to treat the patient, okay, then I will treat it. Like, for example, in the presence of endometrioma, NICE guideline advise removal of endometrioma when there is a fertility problem because it will improve the pregnancy rate. Okay, yes, Dr. Daly, diagnostic laparoscopy is a gold standard, yes. So initial is TVS, gold standard is diagnostic laparoscopy. For this question, because it has fertility, it will also be diagnostic laparoscopy or lab and dye test if it is present. Clear? So again, what is the initial or first investigation when you suspect endometriosis? TVS. What is the gold standard for endometriosis? Laparoscopy. I don't know if this is clear enough or not, but hopefully it is. Okay. When you have fertility problem along with endometriosis, you go for laparoscopy as well. Okay. Good. We have a woman with polycystic ovarian syndrome. Attend for follicle tracking after starting clomiphene therapy. There is no sign of any follicular development. What is the most appropriate management? For a woman who had PCOS, she came for tracking. No signs of any follicular development. What is the most appropriate management that you will take now? You will increase the dose, right? Right? Okay. So, which answer? sounds to be the best. Would you please choose? I have one answer, say clomiphene here. And I have reduce clomiphene. I have increase clomiphene. Okay, and what do you think? Yes, increase clomiphen. Yes. Okay, so increase clomiphen and increase clomiphen that will be on day two to six of hair cycle. Right? Okay. A woman attended the gynecology clinic for follow up. She originally presented with urinary incontinence, but the diagnosis was unclear from history. What is the most appropriate investigation or management from the last? When the diagnosis is not clear, what I need to do, it's one of the indication. No. 
is not i'm sorry it's not video aerodynamic it's not bladder diary okay it's a urodynamic right no 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 it's not urine the mistake it's not it's not bladder it's diary guys it's 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 clear no it's not difficult as well dr maisa okay if we just go okay to the indication of urodynamic test you will find it clearly in the first or second options what is the indication of urodynamic okay your dynamic test is not routine in the investigation of urinary incontinence. Your dynamic test, okay, is a test that we do when the when the type of the incontinence is not clear, okay, and this is your leading word, okay. Bladder diary, it's something in the very initial history taking in the assessment of the case. You take a history from the woman, okay, and you ask her to write this history in a bladder diary and present it to you. Is it an investigation? No, bladder diary is not an investigation, okay? Bladder diary is assessment. Okay, you just ask her to write the history. Okay. Initial test at the GB level for a woman who had urinary incontinence is urinary debstep. But if I have in the indication something that's written to me, guys, I said before, this exam is looks like the puzzle game right fill in the spaces they ask you questions about okay they ask you questions that is have some part from the guideline and you have to find where is the match that match this scenario okay dr rawi idea i need to tell you that this is very easy okay we are speaking about the mrcug exam standard and the mrcug exam standard is specifically as i said you have to be very very clear with the information given to you from the guideline and it's like you know best match okay so in the indication of urodynamic test okay we have edge predominant mixed urinary incontinence or when urinary incontinence when the type is unclear so this is in the first line of the of the indications right symptoms suggestive of voiding dysfunction what is avoiding dysfunction my friends Avoiding dysfunction when there is a problem, like for example, the lady, she cannot initiate the urination, right? Like the lady, she cannot feel the desire, okay? And all of a sudden she had incontinence, like the postpartum voiding dysfunction. Or the lady, she had to strain in order to complete her urination right so this is what is called as voiding dysfunction okay okay anterior or apical prolapse anterior or apical prolapse is indication a history of previous surgery for stress urinary incontinence. History of previous surgery of stress urinary incontinence is indication for urodynamic. May I ask you, for stress urinary incontinence, do I need 
to do aerodynamic test before surgery? Yes or no? No. Yes, excellent. So no need for pure symptoms of stress urinary incontinence to do a urodynamic test. When to do the video urodynamic? If you have a patient who are at risk of renal complication or neurological disorder, like patient of spina bifida. Okay, so video urodynamic in renal complication or neurological disorder. So in exam, I have a patient, he just give me that this patient, she have problem with the incontinence and she had history of spina bifida and she comes on well chair. What is the investigation of choice? Video urodynamic, right? So please be careful, okay? When he give you something that we call this a buzzword, or we call it a leading word in the scenario, it's something lead you to choose this option specifically. So when he said that the diagnosis is unclear, he just had copy from the guideline, okay, and from the TUG article as well. So you you will see this sentence. You say. It's a urodynamic test. Okay, so the urodynamic test is not present in options, right? I can't find it in in the options, or I can't see another option with the same meaning. What do you think? Is urodynamic is present in the options or not? Filling and voiding systematic, excellent, okay? So it's the filling and voiding systematic. So this is the answer. Are we clear so far? Okay, I have one question with asterisk okay this question i just put it for as a tricky question okay i put it for my excellent candidates a woman attended the gynecology clinic for follow-up she originally presented with urinary incontinence but the diagnosis was unclear from the history she had since okay, had a conventional urodynamics, okay, which is a urodynamic, the filling and void, uh, filling and voiding systematic, okay, but the diagnosis is still unclear, so she had the urodynamic is still, we are not sure about the diagnosis, diagnosis is still unclear, so what is the most appropriate investigation or management from that list of options, so even if after urodynamic is still the classic type or the conventional type is still diagnosis not clear. Then I, can I go to the video? Yes, I can go to the video urodynamic because the video urodynamic will be a urodynamic with a scan in the same time. Okay, so I can see by my eyes, okay, the urinary tract, okay, and the process of the filling and the urination, okay? So this might help me to find out if there is anatomical problem, okay? It can help me in the diagnosis, right? Yes, well done, my friends. In this question, a couple present to clinic with two years of primary infertility. The woman had regular 28 day cycle or investigations are normal. What is the most appropriate management? So here, my friends, what is my buzzword in this scenario? I have two years, right? Unexplained infertility for two years duration is IVF. Okay? Yes, excellent. Well done.
a woman with androgen insensitivity syndrome, which karyotype is most likely for the clinical description? That's very easy, right? Yes, it's XY. Yes, excellent. 46XY is the correct. Yes. Oh, sorry. A partial molar. Which karyotype is most likely for the clinical description? Partial mole is mainly triploid, right? So, two spans, for example. Fertilized one over. Nice. So we will have triple. So it's 90, sorry, 69 XXY. Okay, so this is the most common one. And it's very common question in your recalls, right? 16 year old girl present with pelvic pain. Ultrasound scan demonstrated bilateral ovarian mass. Investigation show her to have hyperprolactinemia and elevated serum lactate dehydrogenase. What is the most likely pathological diagnosis? Bilateral with elevated LGH. This is classic presentation of this germinoma. Yes, excellent. Okay, good. Yes, it's this germinoma. A woman who previously had total abdominal hysterectomy and bilateral salpingoafferectomy presented with chronic pelvic pain. A laparoscopy was performed, but no obvious cause was found. What is the most likely diagnosis? It's tricky, okay, from the chronic pelvic pain guideline. As we said, we have guidelines to stick with, right? So, in the guideline, in the chronic pelvic pain, there was case series of 26 women with laparoscopy negative chronic pelvic pain undergoing MRI. They found in 20 of the 26, injury to the levator in eye okay when they have compare between comparison between this group and another pain-free group they have done for the pain-free pain -free group mri as well none of the of these women have such injury okay so that's why they said that it's a musculoskeletal pain, okay? So, a spasm of the muscle of the pelvic floor is proposed to have a cause of pelvic pain can be reduced by botulinum toxin injection, okay? So, this is exactly the same words from the guideline. Okay, guys? So, after surgeries, such as a total abdominal hysterectomy, musculoskeletal pain due to injuries to the muscles and muscle spasm. Okay, so answer is musculoskeletal. Okay. Okay. A woman present to the GP with abdominal distension and loss of appetite. Okay. He didn't say what is the age of the woman, but this is a red flag signs of what? This is a red flag sign of ovarian cancer. Yes. Okay. Serum CA125 found to be 70. What is the most appropriate investigation or management from the list of options? So do you remember when you suspect 
ovarian cancer, especially if this woman is older in age, the GB have already done the CA125. So what is next? Yes, you need a scan, right? So DVS would be the best. However, I can't see it in option. I can't see pelvic ultrasound scan. So can I put pelvic ultrasound scan? Yes, sure, why not? How would you calculate the RMI here without the scan result? So I agree with you that we need to calculate the, the RMI. So to do so, we must have the ultrasound, right? Does this make any sense? Yes, I need the ultrasound so I can calculate the RMI. Twenty-three-year-old woman present to the gynecology clinic with pelvic pain that varies in severity throughout the menstrual cycle. What is the most likely diagnosis? Because the first step, Dr. Rawia, in the diagnosis is. CA 125, especially if she both monopausal. Okay, anyway, thank you guys for your answer. Your answer is correct. Okay, so yes, endometriosis is the correct one. She had pain related to the menstrual cycle. So it is. Endometriosis, yes. Okay, so my friends, I will never actually get bored from saying that you have to revise the most important algorithm of the guidelines. Some guidelines are very important for your exam. I would say that there's no way going to the exam without those guidelines or so those algorithms in your mind. One of the most important thing okay, is the ovarian cyst and masses, okay? So you will go to the exam and you will see yourself that at least you might have 10 questions regarding the ovarian cyst and masses because we have many, many publications from the college. We have a guideline for post-ovarian cyst and masses. We have premenopausal right complex ovarian masses we have took article for the childhood ovarian cyst we have took article for adenixial mass in pregnancy we have ovarian cancer guideline one from the british gynecological uh, cancer society and one from the nice guideline so it's a big part from your curriculum okay so in the diagnosis, this is for Dr. Rawia specifically. What is the first thing written here, my dear? In this guy, in this algorithm. For postmenopausal ovarian cyst, and he wrote cystic legion one cm or more. So if there is one cm in the postmenopausal, I need to investigate, right? Yes, it it's a must. Measure the CA125, right? So it came first, dear, as you can see. TVS plus or minus TAS. Then calculate the RMI, right? So we go to the stepwise approach in the answers, okay? And that's why he will give you in the options two or three options that sounds for you correct, but one will be actually is the answer and the other one is not. Why? Because simply in this exam, it's very important when you go to the algorithm, you go stepwise approach, okay? Don't jump, okay? This is one thing. Another thing, if you have in the options in the exam, my friends, something that even against the guideline, 
Like, for example, a GP, he have seen a woman with uh, heavy menstrual bleeding, right? He arranged MRI scan for her. Okay? And he found that there is a multiple fibroid in the result of the scan. So please, please, okay, hold on. Your question will be about the management of fibroid. So don't bother yourself by why the GB did the MRI first, right? Is that correct? So please don't question the examiner. Why did he do this first? Or why did he choose this? Or why this investigation is done first? Don't bother yourself, please. Focus on what is requested from you to answer. Okay, so this exam, guys, is not only about knowledge. Your knowledge contribute to around 50% of your mark, but the technique of exam and how to choose the answer correctly and apply the information that you have on the guideline is the other part or the other half of your mark. And this is exactly what will make you pass or not. So please be careful. Be smart when you study. My friends, again here, another proof that recommended that ovarian system postmenopausal women should be initially assessed by measuring serum cancer antigen 125 CA 125 level and the transvaginal ultrasound scan. Which one came first? CA-125. Yes, it's CA-125. Thank you very much. Okay, I have another question here on my chat. It's about the patient who have pelvic pain that vary in severity throughout the menstrual cycle. Why not PMS? Or if I have a PMS, shall I choose PMS and leave endometriosis? What do you think? No, actually, I wouldn't choose PMS. What's the definition of the PMS? What is a PMS, actually? Guys, PMS is the name of symptoms that the woman experiences in the week before her period, okay? She should be completely normal, okay, in the first half of period, and then she starts to have her symptoms. What is the symptoms? Is the symptoms pain? No, not only pain. It's mainly start by the mood change, mood swing, okay? Tiredness, tummy pain, headache, and sometimes they might have a spotty skin, okay? So the symptoms of the PMS does not only have pain, okay? So mood swing, feeling upset, anxious, irritable, tiredness, problem with sleeping, bloating, tummy pain, breast tenderness, headache, okay? This is the PMS. Okay, so let's see question 14. A 30 year old woman had a pelvic ultrasound scan as part of fertility investigation. This shows a simple 4CM cyst in the right ovary. What is the most appropriate investigation or management from the list option below? A 30 year pre menopausal. She had ultrasound as part of fertility assessment. There is 4CM simple cyst. What do you think? For simple cyst below five, do? Nothing, so we will choose conservative management. Yes, correct. 
18 years old present with ache in the right iliac fossa. A pelvic ultrasound shows complex ovarian mass, 6 cm in diameter. Okay. What is the most appropriate investigation or management from the list of options below? If it, if it is 6 cm. So, Dr. Beacom, kindly write your question in the group because I can't actually discuss it now. Okay, so we have 48, right? And that means above 40. Okay, so with the 6 cm diameter, what I need to do? CA125. If the age is below 40, what is the investigation I would choose? What adolescent talk? Dear, please look here to the age. Okay, so please, guys, look to the age. Is that adolescence? However, we stick to the guideline. Our patient age here, guys, is 48 as well. Please, when you read the question, take care of the age of the patient. That make a very big difference, okay, in your management. If below 40, I will do the other tumor markers, okay, which is the LDH, alpha fetoprotein, and HCG. However, some clinician will choose to do also three plus the CA125 because to exclude, they want to exclude the possibility of epithelial tumor, however, it's less, okay? But the college say that it's recommended to do the alpha fetoprotein HCG LDH in below 40, right? So here the age is 48. So for the age of 48 around the menopause, what is the investigation that I need to do here now? What is the type of tumor that's common at that age? epithelial, so CA125. The most common HPV subtype in vaginal squamous cell carcinoma, what is the most prevalent subtype of human papilloma virus? It's, yeah. Sixteen and eighteen, correct. Okay. So for Dr. Dilly, he requested um, information about adenixial masses in pregnancy. So kindly revise my session, okay? And took article, dear. And then after that, if you have still queries, please send it to me. Phenotype. Female karyotyping is 45 XO. Okay, this is Turner. So elevated estrogen, undetectable. Uh, sorry, FSH. Uh, elevated estrogen is undetectable. Uterus present. Regarding the clinical information, what is the most likely diagnosis? That's Turner. Yes. Okay. So what is the most common HPV subtype in the vertical vulgaris? Words is vaginal words or anal words. It's six and eleven. Okay, so this one is not a vaginal one.
however it can it, it will be called also by subtype from the human babyloma virus but not something serious it's one and two okay so for this one the velica vulgaris this one it's one and two okay it's not as the same as words a complete mold which karyotype is most likely for the clinical description a complete mold usually comes from duplication of single sperm which fertilize an empty ovum so it will be all comes from the parent the male okay the material comes from the parent so which one is most common it's 46 No, it's duplication, dear. It will be duplication. So we find 46XX. Okay, this is the one that most common. Okay. There's a possibility, let's say a sperm Y duplicated, right? No, unfortunately, that YY is not possible. Why? Because the chromosome Y has no ability to form cells. Okay, so it's only 46XX. It's a recall question as well. So, similar question to that, you will find it in the exam, I mean. So, 16-year-old girl who have never had sexual intercourse present with symptoms of endometriosis. So, here he gives you that she is a virgin, right? What is the most appropriate investigation or management from the list of options below? This particular point is written in the ISHRI guideline of endometriosis regarding the examination, okay, and its rectal examination, okay. Okay. Ultrasound will come next, okay, so at the assessment. The GDG or the guideline developing group recommended that clinicians should perform a clinical examination in all women suspected of endometriosis. Although vaginal examination may be inappropriate for adolescents or women um, without previous sexual intercourse, in such cases, rectal examination can be helpful in the diagnosis of endometriosis. Okay, guys. He said or management. He said investigate most appropriate investigation or management from the list of options below. Okay. And the part from the guideline, you will find it in the answer sheet. Okay. It's just a copy paste from the guideline. Do you think, guys, that I created this question? No, I didn't create this question. I have my sources. So believe me, okay, that it's a tricky. It's exam standard the questions. So be careful in the detail details. Okay. Couple attend the fertility clinic with secondary infertility. The man is found to have azospermia and elevated testosterone and low FSH. What is this from the male to fertility? What is your diagnosis? What we have learned, my friend? Elevated testosterone, low FSH. What is this? In the diagnosis. That's 
anabolic steroid use, right? So when it is hypogonadism, and the hypogonadism comes from the FSH that is low or high? Low, okay, low. But there is high testosterone. So from where is this testosterone came? From where? What is the source? What is the most common source in our life? Unfortunately, Yes, that's anabolic steroid. Excellent. Okay, so what is the management of anabolic steroid? First management is to stop immediately, right? Yes, immediately stop. Excellent. Okay, so if it is not working, because we will repeat the investigation, Four to twelve between four to twelve months after stop, okay. And if we find that there is no response, what could be the intervention from our side? Because most of the male after stop, they can have restoration of the you know spermatogenesis, but unfortunately, because it is related to the period. Okay, they have used so long term exposure to anabolic steroids can lead to low response when we stop. Okay, so what, what can we do from our side? Okay, there is something that we can do before the donor spam. We can give a trial of hormones, something that help the low FSH. Okay, from where you give this answer, guys? Okay, so that will be, we are trying to do some activation. This will be by, we can give HMG, right? Is that correct? It's a very famous case in the part three exam. You will have a mail, inshallah, you will have part three very soon. So you will have a mail and this mail will have anabolic steroid. He stopped for time, but is not working yet. Okay, still his uh, investigation are not good. So what will be the advice? The advice is to, of course, you will be seen by fertility doctor, endocrinologist is a must. Okay, but administration of human chorionic gonadotropin and human uh, menopausal gonadotropin also can be helpful. Okay, my friends, so this is for the anabolic steroid. First step, stop. First step is to stop immediately the anabolic steroid. Okay, for the male subfertility, you need to understand from the classification, it's a pre-testicular cause or it's a testicular cause or a post-testicular cause. Okay. Pre-testicular is something that comes from before the test. It comes from the higher level. So it's a hypothalamic disease or pituitary disease. And it will be characterized by hypo production, right? So FSH will be low, okay? Hypothalamic disease, like for example, Kalaman syndrome in male as well, pituitary disease, 
like insufficiency tumor, radiation surgery, hyperprolactinemia in male, or exogenous hormone. Okay, so the anabolic steroid is the source of the elevated testosterone, as you can see in this case. Testicular causes is like testicular failure, right? So testicular failure characterized by hyper, right? So we will see that the male had high FSH as well, okay? Post-testicular is obstruction causes, okay? Either congenital or acquired, like congenital like cystic fibrosis, congenital absence of vas, acquired like vasectomy or infection that destroyed the vas as well, okay? Or atrogenic vasal injury. Could be also due to sexual dysfunction, okay? Or disorder of sperm function or motility, like immotile cilia syndrome. In the third type or the post-testicular, as you said, guys, what do I expect for the hormonal level? Hormonal level would be normal or abnormal? Normal, the problem is obstruction, right? The problem is it's in the way out, right? So understanding the cause of the male problem is the key, okay, of understanding of what is the treatment, right? So the treatment, in the first case, the pre-testicular, because it's mostly hormonal problem, okay, will be a hormonal manipulation or treating the cause, right? In the second, testicular causes, usually it will be not working because testis is failed, like the ovarian failure. So we will depend mainly on donors after we investigate and make sure that there is no... Um, sperms at all okay by the sticker biopsy third one is either surgery if applicable okay or sperm extraction as well if applicable in the cystic fibrosis not advised okay to do sperm extraction in the cystic fibrosis because the male carry a problem in his gene so the treatment will be by the donor sperm okay because you don't want to take his gene, right, to fertilize a female by IVF, or sorry, by ICSI, right? So it will be sperm donation. Okay, okay. So this one we said conservative, right? Another question about the HPV subtype covered by the most extensively used vaccine. What is the most prevalent subtype of the human papilloma virus. Which one that's covered by the vaccine? 6, 11, 16, and 18, right? Yes. In this question, we have 38-year-old woman present with chronic pelvic pain. The pain is mainly suprapubic, okay? She also suffered with dyspronia and nocturia. What is the most likely diagnosis? This triad can be seen in the bladder pain syndrome. Yes, here he gives you the other name, okay, which is the interstitial cystitis. So this is the answer. Okay, answer of the previous question for my friends who didn't hear me, the male question, no treatment is required at this level, okay, because we will stop. If the stop is not there, then no treatment required at this moment. Okay, so for the question 24, a woman with previous history of trans cervical resection of endometrium for heavy menstrual bleeding. Present with chronic pelvic pain, dysmenorrhea, and dysvaronia. What is the most likely diagnosis? So the lady here. What's her problem? 
This is endometriosis. Excellent. Well done. Okay, so the cardinal symptoms, as you can see here, from dysmenorrhea, dyspareunia, and chronic pelvic pain are characteristic of endometriosis or adenomyosis, and it's common complication after the procedure of the transcervical resection, right? PID, okay, so actually, my friends, I can't say PID if I don't have any signs of infection given, no discharge, no fever, okay? And BID does not cause dysmenorrhea. Can cause pain and dyspareunia, but you must have clue for the infection. Okay, so a woman present to the gynecology clinic after referral to the GP. You read the chronic pelvic pain guideline there. You'll find it there. So, woman presented to the gynecological clinic after referral from the GB with bloating and abdominal pain, serum CA125 was 105, okay? And pelvic ultrasound shows some abnormal feature. A risk of malignancy index was calculated and found to be 315. What is the most appropriate investigation or management from the list of options below? So, we have to answer before we go to the options, right? So, now... I have high risk of malignancy index. What shall I do? Yes, you will refer to the MDT. Okay, yes. Yes, please refer to the MDT. Thank you. Female, 17 year old with primary amenorrhea, generally fit and well. Okay. No family history of concern, phenotype, say female, karyotyping is 46XX, FSH is normal, estrogen is normal, uterus is present. Regarding the clinical information above, what is the most likely diagnosis from the last below? Primary amenorrhea, fit and well, no family history, female type, karyotype is normal, FSH is normal, uterus is present. What could be this case? This is a delayed puberty. Yes. Yes. So 27, we have 30 year old woman present with pelvic pain and dyspareunia. Belvic examination suggests mass in the right adenexia. What is the most appropriate investigation or management from the list of options? By the examination, you felt a mass. The symptoms, pelvic pain and dyspareunia. So, TVS, yes. TVS is the correct, yes. A sperm carrying the defective gene of hemophilia A. Which karyotype is most likely for the clinical description? Yes. It's 23X, yes. 36 old years old present with sensation of fullness. It's a sperm, okay? Guys, please, okay? If you, you have to just think, give yourself one second, reread the question. Okay, and you'll find the answers there, clear. Okay, thank you. Yes, well done. No problem, sometimes, you know, when we read fast or we don't take care of some of the details, but if you find that doesn't make any sense to you, go back and reread the question. So, a 36 year, present with sensation of fullness in the left side of pelvis, 
Belvic ultrasound scan demonstrate complex ovarian mass. What is the most appropriate investigation or management from the list of option below? Yeah, so he give you the three tumor markers that recommended by the college, okay, to do the serum alpha fetoprotein LDH and HCG. A woman with history of endometriosis present with dysphagia and cyclic rectal bleeding. What is the most appropriate investigation? This question is very common in the MRCBI and MRCB. COG, sorry. So post have this question. For the rectal endometriosis, TVS would be useful for the identifying or rule out the rectal endometriosis. Yes. 25 year old attend for pelvic ultrasound scan as part of fertility investigation. The scan show unilateral ovarian mass with areas of intense calcification at one pole. There is a speckle appearance throughout the rest of the cyst. Tumor markers are normal. What is the most likely pathological diagnosis? Unilateral mass, she has intense calcification at one pole. It's stratoma, yes. So since tumor markers are okay, are normal, so what type of stratoma is that? That's benign, right? Benign cystic stratoma. Excellent, my dear friends. 55 year old woman, Okay, yes, dear, it's a teratoma. Okay, this is the classic ultrasound features of the teratoma. Since the tumor markers are normal, then the only possible diagnosis, it's a benign cystic teratoma. Okay. A 55-year-old woman present with postmenopausal bleeding Ultrasound scan demonstrates solid ovarian mass. Serum in hepin, estradiol, both elevated. Yes, I know it's very easy. <laughs> okay, it's a granulosa. Yes, it's a granulosa cell tumor. Okay, that's present with breast tenderness, bleeding, right? And elevated estradiol, inhibin also will be increased. So it's granulosa. A woman present to the gynecology clinic, history and bladder diary. Okay. So before I read the question, I'll answer it in the chat box. What is the sicoma, dear? Sicoma, it's common in postmenopausal women. That will be solid and unilateral, okay? If it is functional, this will be, could be androgen secreting or estrogen secreting, okay? So, if you have the clinical presentation of the granulosa cell tumor, with the elevated estrogen and inhibin in the same time. So please go to the most common. What's common is common. Okay. Sicoma can present the previous question that came in the exam with the sicoma was androgen secreting with features of virilis. Okay. So let's read the question 73. A woman present to the gynecology clinic history in the bladder diary suggests diagnosis of overactive bladder. The patient previously had insertion of transpurator tap for stress incontinence. Okay, what 
is the most appropriate investigation or management from the list of options. So here, the lady presented with symptoms suggestive of overactive blood. But the thing, or the thing that's complicated her history that she had a previous failed surgery for stress urinary incontinence. So now we need a urodynamic test, right? Okay, yeah, so for a previous failed urodynamic test, then I will choose filling and voiding systometry as answer. Yes, yes, okay, thank you. Again, indication of the urodynamic, urodynamic is very important to Garticle. Very important also, the indication came in the NICE guideline of urinary incontinence. So please revise it for your exam. Phenotype is female. Karyotype is 46XY, so male. FSH elevated, estrogen undetectable, uterus is present. Regarding the clinical information above, which one is the most common? Which one is male but has uterus? Sawyer, yes, excellent. 40 year old woman present with discomfort and fullness in the left side of the pelvis. Clinical examination suggests the presence of a mass. The woman gives history of previous leads. What is the most appropriate investigation or management from that option? Okay, so she had discomfort and fullness in the pelvis. What is the investigation that I need here? TVS, yes, excellent, okay. You think the previous history of lids will make difference in your answer? Still, you need to check what is a mass, pelvic mass, TVS, right? Okay. A woman who is frail, 68, with chronic obstructive airway disease, Okay, and she presents with abdominal bloating. Ultrasound scan show pelvic mass and ascites. Serum CA125 is 170. What is the most appropriate investigation or management of from the list of options below? Okay, so again, 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 stepwise approach, stepwise approach. My friend, step by step, please. I will all say that till exam. Stepwise approach. When you go to the algorithm, you will find in the algorithm that in the stepwise approach, after CA125, TVS, then comes the calculate RMI, right? Yes, it is, okay? If you give you RMI high already, then more than 200, then go to the next step. So it will be referral, right? Okay, so here, is calculate RMI. I need you to revise. Okay. This is what you will do, my friend, in the stepwise approach. Okay. So I I don't believe me. Okay. I don't myself. Okay. Say one answer based on my opinion. What I do is, what I do is apply the guideline and stick to the guideline word by, ro by word, okay? So when you have three steps written to you, please apply the guideline. 
apply the algorithms that are given to you. He give you CA125, he give you the scan done. So what is the most appropriate investigation or management? That means what will be advised next. Advised next is to calculate the RMI, okay? So I don't suggest an answer. I give you evidence of answer, okay? If you're not convinced, then it's the guideline what to say. Okay, dear. So CT after MDT, the guideline says there that you will do MDT, okay, and arrange for CT. So it's CT with ongoing referral. Okay. So a 25-year-old woman is seen in the clinic with eight months history of chronic pelvic pain. The pain is continuous but improves with defecation. The onset of pain was associated with a change in the form of her stool. What is the most likely diagnosis? So pain that's associated with a change of the score. What criteria is it, my friend, if you remember? Room three criteria, right? When there is continuous or recurrent abdominal pain or discomfort in at least three days. So the rule says three, right? In three days, in a month, in the last three months, at least three months, with onset of at least before that chronic pain within six months. So you will have two of three. What is the three improvement with defecation? Onset associated with a change of frequency of a stool. Onset associated with a change in the form of uh, in the form of stool. So frequency or form or improve with defecation. This is the room three criteria. So here the case has two of them. So this is irritable bowel. There is a famous talk article about the irritable bowel syndrome and the endometriosis dilemma for the obstetrician. However. The information is clear in the guideline of the chronic pelvic pain. We have another question for a woman with recurrent urinary tract infection referred for further assessment. Urine dipstick is negative. What is the most appropriate, appropriate investigation or management from the list of options below? Okay, when to do a cystoscopy? What is the indication of a cystoscopy in recurrent UTI? Microscopic, the presence of microscopic hematuria in which age? Sixty and above. Or what? Older age. That's very important. Microscopic hematuria, apply cystoscopy in the investigation. However, here he give you a woman. He didn't say what age, okay? She had recurrent urinary tract infection, right? At the moment, this is the, this is the situation that we have. What does the guideline say is for that? The guideline say measure the post wide residual volume by the bladder scan or castorization in women who have voiding dysfunction or recurrent UTI. Use a bladder scan in preference to castorization, okay, in the ground of accessibility and lower incidence of adverse event. Right? So here we don't need to mix 
cystoscopy by the blood scan. Okay, there is no indication for the cystoscopy at this moment. Clear, my friend? Okay. A woman with BMI 35 attend with her partner for fertility investigation. She had secondary amenorrhea. She's awaiting a histosalpingogram. What is the most appropriate management? It's easy. She had secondary amenorrhea, and now you need to have a management. She's awaiting the histosalpingogram. What is the first investigation we do for secondary amenorrhea? UBT? Good. Okay. So I have UBT first to ensure that she's not pregnant. What is the next action? The next action is start withdrawal progesterone for withdrawal to induce withdrawal bleed. What is the number of days required? It's a 10 days, right? So here, if I go to the options, I will find that check pregnancy test. If negative, then start 10 days course of progesterone. Check pregnancy test. If negative, then start 21 day course of combined oral contraceptive pills, which is not the one recommended in the guideline. Okay. Or what else? No option for the pregnancy test. So here I need to do this one, okay? So this is the fourth option. Yes. In 40, same sex female couple attend the clinic requesting treatment. The partner wishing to carry the pregnancy have been investigated and looks normal. What is the most appropriate management? IUI, right, with donor sperm. This is the action, right? So what is the options I have? I have ICSI, IVF, no treatment required, check pregnancy, check pregnancy, check pregnancy, clomiphene, donor insemination. Okay, so I have donor insemination. Oh, yeah, I have intrauterine insemination with donor uh, sperm. Okay, I have intrauterine, sorry, I'm sorry. I have intrauterine insemination with partner sperm. I have ovulation induction with FSH. I have reduced to clomiphen. Okay. So, my friends, which one would you choose? Okay, so everyone it choose to have the intrauterine insemination with the donor sperm.
Okay, so you can see that. Okay, so for the people who want to choose, I can see now that we have two. Okay, um, one says donor insemination means that it could be intracervical or intrauterine. Okay, and someone says that intrauterine is better because it will achieve a better result with the donor spam. So which one shall I go for? What do you think? It's very tricky here, okay, because actually it comes from the, the clinic itself, the clinic work. You know, guys, when we have same-sex couple, we in the guideline, it's straightforward donor sperm with IOI, okay? This is in the guideline. So what is the tricky about donor insemination and IOI? The thing is that, you know, the advice that we sometimes tell the same-sex couple, okay, that they can try to find a donor in between their family members or their friends, okay, rather than waiting for the spam you know, um, IUI from the sperm bank because nowadays it's not there is shortage, you know, in the sperm bank. So if they can have somebody who donate, okay, for them, okay, that will be easier. Some can agree to have sexual relation, okay, in order, you know, to get pregnant. Some will say no to this donor, okay, I, I don't want to have a sexual relation. I want you, okay, to come with me to the clinic and you give the semen there and they will insert it by the IOI. Have you got the point, guys? So donor insemination can be a general term and under the general term, there is different ways okay on how to do it and so on the intrauterine insemination with or the iui with donor sperm okay is the official one that comes in the guideline okay so yes yes that so that's why i would say that i will go with the same one that came in the guideline okay right okay yes i will go for this one okay so the most common hbv subtype found in vulval interpsedial neoplasia what is the most prevalent subtype in human papilloma virus? In vulval interpsial neoplasia, it's is it the same? Yes, sixteen and eighteen. Thank you. The gold standard test for diagnosis of endometriosis is diagnostic laparoscopy. Yes, correct. Well done. A woman attended the GP surgery with symptoms of urinary incontinence. She also has dysuria and urine tip stick is positive for leukocytes and nitrates. The MCU has been sent. So what shall I do now? The woman had symptoms or no symptoms of infection? She had this theory, right? The mistake is positive, so antibiotic. Right, so appropriate antibiotic is the answer. Well done, yes, perfect. So, my superstars, what is the most common HPV subtype in inogenital words? 
that's six and eleven. Well done. Okay. Plan filter syndrome keratyping. Forty seven X X Y. Well done. Twenty five year old nadeparous woman found to have ATM ovarian mass suggestive of the remote cyst. What is the appropriate management? ATM. What should we do? Surgery, right? What type of surgery for ATM? Laparoscopy or laparotomy? Yeah. A laparotomy because of the size. Yes. So we prefer the lap cystectomy for larger size masses. Okay. However, it has solid component. So we will try to remove it right in one piece. Avoid that you spill any of its content because it has solid component. So you go for the laparotomy in this case. If it is simple, simple is easy. Simple, go for lapsistectomy. Okay, so this is the difference here, Dr. Shitan, that it has a solid component because of the suggestive of dermoid. A 45-year-old woman having total abdominal hysterectomy and bilateral salpingoferectomy for resistant. Ovarian mass. A laparotomy is suspected that the mass could be an ovarian cancer. Also, it appears confined to the ovary. 45, having total abdominal hysterectomy and bilateral salpingoferectomy. For persistent ovarian mass, laparotomy is suspect. It is done, okay, suspected the mass as ovarian cancer. What shall you do now? You will do assessment of lymph nodes. Okay, so lymph retroperitoneal lymph node assessment need to be done. Okay, I'm not going to do a lymphadenectomy at the moment. Okay, I will do assessment. Okay, which can contain uh, taking, you know, um, you know, if there is suspected something or some according to the consent. So that's why he said. Lymph node assessment. Yes, for 46, answer is laparotomy, and we have explained, I think, it's a dermoid cyst or, you know, presence of complex component or a solid component. So you need to take it in one piece, okay? You can't do this through the port of the laparoscopy, so you need a laparotomy. Okay. The question says, what is the management? He is not asking about the investigation or next step. He asks you, what, what is the management for ATM mass? Management of ATM mass is remove it, right? Fifty-five year old presented to GP with persistent feeling of bloating and abdominal pain over the past three months. What is the next step? Is not common, okay, that they present with 
bloating and abdominal pain or IBS symptoms in this age, right? So if the woman is 50 or over, okay, and she report have resistant or frequent um, urinary tract, okay, uh, sorry, sorry, irritable bowel syndrome like bloating, bloating or problem in digestion. This is a red flag sign of cancer, right? So, what shall I do now? Which investigation comes first? Okay. So, apparently, we have a problem with a with this guideline. Still, some they don't have a clear concept regarding this. My dear friends, please, the guideline is one of the gold, okay, and very important guideline. Yes, it's older uh, than many of the guidelines that we have now. It's 2016, I think, okay, but it's still, it's important for the exam. Hot topic. Please read it carefully and apply the investigation carefully, okay? In the assessment of a woman present with postmenopausal ovarian cyst, or she is at the age of 50 or more and she has symptoms suggestive of indigestion or uh, bloating or pressure symptoms or uh, abdominal distension, this is, comes as a red flag signs of ovarian cancer. When you have suspect a suspect of red flag signs of ovarian cancer, the first or the initial investigation to do is CA-125. Next investigation is the TVS. And simply, my friend, this is the guideline because it's a UK guideline. That's because ultrasound is not present in the clinic like most of the clinics in the overseas. Ultrasound is a different department, okay? The patient will present to her GP. GP doesn't have an ultrasound to do. So what he will do? He will ask for investigation. What investigation he will ask for? The blood test and the ultrasound appointment. Which one can be done faster? The blood test comes first, right? Then ultrasound appointment, okay, will come. So the lady, after she had the blood test and the ultrasound result comes out, you can now calculate the risk of malignancy index for this patient, right? Some of the GB will even await the CA125 first, the result will come fa faster, okay? And based on the result, they, they will ask for ultrasound or not. Okay, so again, read the guideline, please. And the highlighted point in the guideline, you need to take care of it because it's repeated questions in the EMQs. And usually in the EMQs, you will have very similar answers to each other. So you must understand the base, how to choose, which one to choose. Okay, I will advise you go at the same arrangement of the guideline. So here, my friends, let's go quickly to the highlighted point here. In a postmenopausal presenting with acute abdominal pain, okay? So think about ovarian cyst accident like torsion, rupture, or hemorrhage, right? It is recommended that ovarian cyst in postmenopausal women should initially assist by measuring the serum CA125 level and a TVS. What is the role of history and the clinical examination in postmenopausal women with ovarian cyst? Of course, thorough medical history should be taken, especially for the symptoms, red flag signs of malignancy. Okay, family history or personal history of cancer, like breast cancer, for example. Where family history is significant, what you need to do? Each line of this, 
tested before in the exam in MQ question. So where family history is significant, referral to the regional cancer genetic surface should be considered, right? Appropriate tests should be carried out in any postmenopausal woman who have developed symptoms within the last 12 months that suggest of irritable bowel syndrome, particularly in a woman over 50, or those with significant family history of ovarian bowel or breast cancer. Full examination, physical examination, is essential, and this should include body mass index, abdominal examination to detect ascites, and characterize any palpable mass and vaginal examination. What blood test should be performed in postmenopausal women with ovarian cyst? CA125 again, okay? So CA125 is the only serum tumor marker that's used for primary evaluation, and it's allowed the risk of malignancy index to be calculated. Serum CA125 level should not be used in isolation to determine if the cyst is malignant or not. While a very high value may assist in reaching a diagnosis, normal value does not exclude cancer. What is the role of ultrasound? The TVS is the single most effective way of evaluating the ovarian system post menopausal woman, but also transabdominal will be helpful. When to do transabdominal in assessment of post menopausal cyst? When to do a transabdominal in assessment of postmenopausal cyst? When the cyst is large in size, okay? Yes, for large in size, then you will need both TVS and transabdominal because actually the scope of the TVS is limited, okay? So if the cyst is abdominal, so no way that the TVS can show you the whole cyst. You will need the transabdominal in this case. Shall I do Doppler or 3D at the first assessment? No. What is the role of CT? CT, MRI, or even PET scan are not recommended in the initial evaluation, okay? But when to do a CT or MRI, MRI will be done. If the ultrasound is not conclusive, this is also an EMQ question, okay? And CT will be done for the abdomen and pelvis when you suspect the malignancy. How to suspect the malignancy? By raised RMI, risk of malignancy index. Okay, my friends. A CT of abdomen and pelvis should be performed for the postmenopausal woman with ovarian cyst who have RMI score greater than or equal to 200 with ongoing referral to the gynecological oncology MDT. Right? What is the role of IOTA in postmenopausal? IOTA is more sensitive and specific, but never used in a triage. Okay? And it, it is not okay the one that's recommended in postmenopausal women. Okay, my friends. So here is the algorithm. In this algorithm, be careful with all the steps, okay? But people tend to solve the big steps correctly, but they tend also to mix or to forget the small details and the arrangement of events. Okay, so postmenopausal ovarian cyst, when the cyst is 1 cm or more, measure the CA125, do TVS plus or minus TAS according to the size, and then calculate RMI. If the risk of malignancy index found to be less than 200, this is a low risk of malignancy. So what is the action? Action depend on the criteria and the size. Cyst fulfilling all of the following criteria. Asymptomatic cyst, no symptoms. Simple cyst, less than five, unilocular, unilateral. So this type of cyst, that will be, 
conservative management. Repeat the assessment in four to six months by CA125, TVS, plus or minus TAS. So in the repeat assessment, in the next appointment after four to six months, I will start again by what? I will start again by the CA125 and the scan. Okay, my friends. So this is for repeat assessment. So we are repeating the same steps. If it resolved, then everybody is happy. Thank you. Bye bye. Discharge. If it persistent, give hair persistent unchanged. No worsening symptoms, no Im different in size, nothing. Then give hair another appointment for reassessment in four to six months. After 12 months of follow up and no change, then the woman will have a discussion. And the treatment will be according to the woman's wishes and the assessment of risk. Either to discharge her back to the GP or to consider intervention. What type of intervention, my friend? The intervention is bilateral salvingo of rectum. Okay? So this is after the follow up. How about if the cyst from the beginning? become symptomatic or non simple cyst in postmenopausal or even if the RMI is low or 5 cm or more or multilocular or bilateral what shall i do surgery okay what type of surgery for a case of low risk of malignancy index but the cyst is either symptomatic or non simple or 5 cm or more what type of surgery? The surgery here will be bilateral salvingo of rectomy, right? What is the pathway for a woman with high risk of malignancy index? The pathway is refer this woman for the MDT and arrange for CT scan, abdomen, and pelvis. How to choose it in the exam? Choose it according to what's written in the question. A question asks you, what is the next investigation? Choose CT, right? Is that correct? Yes, dear, and RMI is there. Look, my dear, RMI is up there. Calculate RMI. Okay, based on the RMI, if it's high, 200 or more, then you will see that this case needs the MDT opinion. Okay. If the MDT have a meeting and they said that the lady had high likelihood of ovarian malignancy, of course, in this MDT meeting or review, they will um, revise the case history, investigation, CT result, if it is there, any other investigation done, and they will decide. This lady is high likelihood of ovarian malignancy, then in this case, they will advise full staging procedure by a trained gynecological oncologist in cancer center. If the MDT review found that low likelihood of ovarian malignancy, then advise laparotomy, and the laparotomy will be pelvic clearance surgery, total abdominal hysterectomy, bilateral salvingoophorectomy, and infracolic omentectomy, plus peritoneal cytology by a suitably trained gynecologist in cancer unit. Right, my friends? This is the algorithm, this is the guideline. If you still have confusion or you, when you solve this question of the postmenopausal ovarian cyst, you still get some questions wrong, please review the guideline and the algorithm together. After that, in order not to forget the important point, please revise those things. The algorithm, it's very important to revise frequently before your exam. Also, from today, 
I also advise you to revise the table of the tumor markers from the TUG article of non-epithelial tumor uh, ovarian, ovarian uh, cancers. Also, I would advise you to revise the cases of primary amenorrhea and its differential diagnosis, okay? So here, my friends, a 12-year-old girl present to his pain and positive pregnancy test. An ultrasound scan confirm a solid ovarian mass but empty uterus. Serum HCG is very elevated. So what is your diagnosis now? That's a choriocarcinoma. Phenotype is female. Karyotype XY. FSH normal, estrogen low, uterus absent. What is this? Androgen insipidity syndrome. Yes. Easy now, right? My dear friends, when you think you can't go on, force yourself, please, to keep going. Your success is based on resistance, okay? Not luck. I would like to thank you all for attending today, and I hope that this MEQ paper was helpful. Um, I have tried to have some of the exam similar questions or scenarios, okay? And uh, I hope that this is clear some concepts from you regarding the questions in the chat box i have a very important questions regarding the evidence i would say my friend that the guidelines is the highest on the you know the pyramid of evidence we have the guidelines right so we follow guidelines especially the rcog guidelines rcog is the same you know, college that you want to be a member of. So it makes sense that you follow the GTG first, okay? So GTG comes first. Then national guidelines like NICE can come, especially in the those point when the GTG are not there. Like for example, fetal monitoring or intrapartum care. We don't have a GTG for that. So we follow the NICE, okay? And it's the national guideline in the UK. Then, TUG articles, TUG article specifically in those important hot topics that repeatedly appear in the exam, they will also want to test your knowledge in the updated TUG article. That's why they will give you some questions from the recent TUG article, especially the last two to three years. Okay, so be aware of the update by reading the uh, guidelines took articles, okay? And if you have different in the view between the took article and a guideline, especially if it's a GTG, please follow the guideline. Okay, my friends? So, hopefully that you uh, find today session is interesting, okay? If you want more of the session, okay, before your exam for July exam, and this time is suitable for you, okay? Please write in the group, okay? And uh, inshallah, I will announce another session. Thank you very much, guys. And uh, if you have any further question, please post it to the group. Thank you very much. See you, bye.